Welcome to the 20th episode of Kabbalistic Mystic, the podcast for the Western Seeker, where we explore the tree of life and the ancient Hebrew wisdom as the last spiritual heritage of the West. I'm your host, Ovadi Batat, and today we'll take a break uh, a little bit from the normal topics and go back to the topic of dreaming. And uh, not only dreaming, we'll talk a little bit more about the role of the subconscious, uh, the subconscious mind. We spoke about her, the subconscious, the feminine portion of our individualized consciousness uh, in previous episodes, but I kind of want to recap and talk a little bit about how she works, because that relates directly to dreaming. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to be referring to a dream sent to me by a listener. Uh, We'll review the dream, talk a little bit about uh, what it could mean, and how to analyze the dream, and about the role of the subconscious in our day-to-day life, and the way way it works, the way she works, and communicates with us, and um, refer to that dream. So stay with me, and uh, let's begin. Danielle Levi, or Levi, if we were in Israel, we would say Levi, but I'm assuming it's Levi, has uh, sent me um, a dream that she had. And it sounds like um, this dream uh, truly impacted uh, Danielle. And uh, it sounds like a very, uh, how should we say, an epic dream. So I'll describe that dream to you, not in the level of detail that she described it to me, but sort of like to get the sense of it and and we'll go from there. So in that dream, Danielle, um, it essentially starts as a nightmare and ends in a really good way, sort of as a blissful dream. And I have to say that already there, that's extremely unique. Usually we have nightmares, we wake up, or we have really good dreams, we wake up. Um, but for a dream to start with a nightmare and then end in bliss, that's, uh, well, that's something that we all somewhat wish wishing for, right? So um, Danielle, I think that, that this is really cool and, um, it sounds, it sounds like this dream really impacted you and I can see why. So in the dream, um, Danielle is driving, um, a truck, a big truck. She's in the driver's seat of a big truck and she can't see anything. It sounds like it's really dark and she's terrified because she doesn't know what lies ahead. It could be a cliff. It could be a tree. It could be another vehicle. Any moment, it sounds like she she can die. And you can only imagine the sheer terror that one has in a situation like that. It sounds like uh, she did not have a pedal, no brakes. So there's only full speed ahead. And she grabs, she can't grab the steering wheel. It's too close to her, pressing on the abdomen. Abdomen. And um, really, she can't do anything. So a real, true loss of control. And in sheer panic, she screams. A scream comes up from uh, deep down uh, to her throat. And uh, even though that she screams, no sound comes out. So right there, um, I mean, if we stop there, there's so much, so much to discuss. But, But let's continue. So... At that particular point, uh, Danielle realizes that there is a particular presence above and beyond her that is conscious and aware of the track and the whole situation. And this realization is somewhat comforting and the panic subsides. And only then when the panic subsides does then occur to her the one thing that she can do and she turns on the headlights. It's still dark, but now she can see the road and there's so much relief to finally see where she's going. And um, suddenly the night is gone and all is illuminated and it becomes a day. Like, you know, often in dreams, something changes um, just like that. And, and so suddenly it's daytime. And actually she sees that she's an overpass, uh, sort of like a fast road. And she sees many different roads below her. So the overpass takes a sudden and very sharp hairpin turn and she travels back to where she came from. Then comes an exit ramp. 
and uh, the truck simply disappeared and the ramp turns into a water chute and she slides down uh, the chute with her arms in the air feeling light and free laughing with joy and immense relief and lands safely and gently in a pool pool of crystal clear water wow what a dream i uh, i wish i had a dream like that it sounds sounds wonderful i mean not the beginning the beginning sounds like horrible terror but uh, it ends well so that's reaffirming, and I can only uh, imagine and understand why, Danielle, you have chosen to share this dream with me. It sounds epic. So let's talk a little bit about that. But before we dive into this dream, there's so many, so many elements and so many symbols and so many uh, sort of motifs that come back in this dream. I think it's a great dream to analyze together, um, if you will. But I want to I wanna start with two other things. I want to talk a little bit about the subconscious and the ways uh, in which she communicates with us. And I say she because when we look at human consciousness, and there's a a whole episode about that, and I don't remember which one it is. I'll I'll try to find out and uh, mention that towards uh, the end of this episode, Um, in which we discuss how the human consciousness work based on the ancient Hebrew wisdom. But I'll kind of recap really fast. We have two sides to our consciousness. We have the personalized consciousness, the individualized consciousness, and we have the cosmic consciousness. And there's a fifth part, but we're not going to go into that right now. But in general, we have uh, the individualized part and the cosmic part. And the individualized part, as well as the cosmic part, are both divided into a masculine and a feminine part. So the masculine side in the individualized consciousness is what we call the conscious mind. And the conscious mind is everything that is uh, aware and conscious of what is happening. And also, and that is a little bit confusing, what in psychology we call the unconscious mind, as in it's above the surface, but we're not aware. We don't have conscious awareness of it, but it, but, but it is sort of you know within reach, within reach of our conscious awareness. So, for example, maybe we're not aware that we're angry or that we're um, that we're upset about something, but it is within reach of our conscious awareness. That is, uh, you know, something that we're unconscious of, but it's there. And that, according to the ancient Hebrew wisdom, is still a part of our uh, masculine conscious mind. The feminine side of our conscious, individualized consciousness, is called the subconscious to distinguish from the unconscious mind. Freud actually said that he does not believe, that does not want to discuss the topic of the subconscious mind because there's no way to investigate it. There's no evidence that it exists, even though that many people have claimed that something exists that's called the subconscious, something that is more tied to to our cosmic existence. And indeed, according to ancient Hebrew wisdom, the subconscious mind actually has access to many things that the conscious mind does not have the ability to grasp and will not have the ability to grasp, except, of course, if we are to break that veil between the conscious and the subconscious mind, which is the veil of forgetfulness, that is, achieve enlightenment. And that that knowledge that the subconscious mind is privy to is our life programming, and essentially the memory of all the rest of our lives and the lessons that we're supposed to study to learn in this in this lifetime. That is, the subconscious is beyond the veil of forgetfulness. She is tied directly to the cosmic side of our consciousness. She has direct access to both the masculine and the feminine sides of our conscious mind. The masculine being the higher self, the feminine being um, the Holy Spirit, which is called in in, in Christianity or in um, the the New Age movement, is called Mother Nature. In tarot, she's called the High Priestess. So let's go back to the um, subconscious mind, which in tarot is called the Empress. We have the Emperor, which is the conscious mind, and the Empress. Now here's the deal: they don't know how to talk to each other. The Empress talks in feelings. She is represented in our conscious mind as the body. 
That's how we see her. We look at our body and we think this is us, but really, this is the feminine side of our consciousness. She manifests herself into existence through a body, a vessel. She's the vessel in which we reside. And the conscious mind, the emperor, is the thinking part of the brain the part that can actually process things and bring them to conscious existence and then decide what to do. He, the conscious side of our mind, it doesn't matter if you're a woman or a man, the masculine side of your individualized consciousness makes decisions. She cannot decide. She has to do what she's being told. He makes all the decisions, but he makes them blindly. He doesn't know where he's going. She knows. But he doesn't listen to her, usually. And that, my friend, right here is the paradox of our entire existence and how, how metaphoric that is, prophetic, really, when it comes to the relationships between men and women. Because everything, as in the micro, so is in the macro, we are all androgynous beings. We all have a masculine and a feminine side. The masculine makes the decision. He is in control, at least thinks he's in control. And she knows where to go, but she does not make decisions. We have free will. That is, the conscious mind has free will. The emperor has. But for him to actually walk the real path, the path of our higher self, he has to listen to her, to the subconscious. And how does she speak to him? She does not speak in logic. She does not speak in words. She speaks in riddles. She speaks in metaphors. She speaks in emotions. She speaks in sensations, in feelings. She speaks to us through the body. She speaks to us in dreams. And she does it really, really well, but she does it metaphorically. She cannot do it directly. She cannot tell us what to do. She cannot tell the conscious mind. When I say us, I mean the conscious part of us, the part of you that listens now and understands. She cannot talk to you directly because then she will infringe on your free will. And that is, my friends, the number one, the, the, the most important rule, the most prominent rule of our conscious existence. We cannot be infringed And so she does it perfectly without infringing on your free will. That is, she speaks to you in metaphors. So how do we listen to her? Well, there's many ways in which she speaks to us. How? Let's talk about uh, uh, coincidence. There is no coincidence. There are no accidents. She can talk to us in various ways. So if you notice something that you've never noticed before, and suddenly you notice it once, twice, three times, that is more than likely something she's trying to tell you. And the dream, Danielle, that you've sent me is a great example. So the way uh, the subconscious speaks to us and the way consciousness works is not only through our own existence, but through the existence of those around us. It weaves in, in some kind of a great intelligence that is to the chaos. So I'll give you an example. I have been noticing again and again, that a particular lesson is coming back to me. That sometimes the solution is extremely easy, is extremely, it's a lot more simple than I think. And I've been struggling with something as of late, something that has been bothering me. It has to do with my personal discipline. And I've been really struggling with it and just like, wow, you know, journaling about it, trying to figure out what's going on with me. Why is this happening? How come I feel like I slipped back into a reality where I I just struggle? I still show up, but I struggle. And I kept getting the message. It's so simple. The solution is so simple. And when you sent me the dream, Danielle, when I read your dream, the thing that popped to me was the simplicity of the solution within your dream, the, the pivotal point, the tipping point from which you have started to go from a nightmare into a blissful dream. And that was the point where you decided to turn on the light. And therefore, there was like, uh, I think it was the third time that I got this message from the universe 
it is so much simpler than you think. And here we are an example where, <coughs> excuse me, where a dream of somebody else, just because it got to me in a particular time in a particular place, is actually a message to me. The subconscious can communicate to you in many, many different ways. And now one will ask and say, well, the subconscious did not communicate that to you. Danielle did. She sent you an email. Well, that is true, but the subconscious tells you what to listen to. There are many things in the dream, but nothing popped out to me, to my own conscious existence, like this one did. There was a palpable uh, difference in, the le- in that particular portion of the lesson, of the dream, for me, than any other portion of the dream. And if I'm to describe that palpable difference, it was almost as if like, oh, this is a message to me. There was almost like a visceral sensation because remember she speaks to us through the body there was a visceral sensation sort of like a light within me that was like heightened awareness and an excitement that was related to that particular portion and immediately within my consciousness the topic of my own issue has risen and so it wasn't induced by my thinking mind then the thinking mind came and said oh maybe that could be also a clue for me. There was a processing, a conscious processing of that particular emotion, of that particular coincidence, and that was my conscious mind. But the um, the initial awareness of it was not. It was quick as a, as, a, as, a, as a light. And that is the subconscious. All right? So I'm giving that as an example of how we can listen to her. We pay attention. We listen to a particular song on the radio, and that song really speaks to us. Oh, we love that song. We listen to the words. What what are the words saying? There is nothing that you hate, that you love. Let's speak about love. Something that you love, that you really appreciate, a food preference, a, a particular car type. There is nothing that you love, that you want, something that you want to buy in a store. There is nothing that you have attraction to or rejection that is not a message from your subconscious. Asking ourselves why can help us understand what is the message she is trying to tell us. It's like you sitting to the table to eat. The food will always keep coming. She communicates to you non-stop. The Song of Song, written by King Solomon, is a metaphor for the subconscious speaking to the conscious mind. The lover, the woman, is the subconscious, and the dodi, the masculine man who is the lover, is the conscious mind. And she keeps looking for him. She keeps seeking him. And he's always escaping. He's always running away. And she goes, and she gets battered, and she gets hurt looking for him. It's a beautiful, beautiful um, uh, piece of text, actually the most beautiful song I've ever known in Hebrew. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I do not like um, almost any of the English translations. I do have one that I do like, and I will, I will recommend that. But um, the reason I'm saying that is because listening to her is critical. And one of the ways in which she speaks to us is in dreams. This is actually a very unique time because our conscious mind is not involved in that moment. And she has the freedom to literally speak to us. We have our entire attention devoted to her. She has center stage. And we actually don't even know most of the time, with the exception of lucid dreaming, that we're dreaming. And so we think that this is reality. And anybody you know who listens to this podcast, who ever had a dream that they thought, oh my God, that felt so real, knows the power of subjective reality. What is dream? What is reality? This entire life that you're living is, a, is an illusion. Not only Hebrew mysticism and the ancient Hebrew wisdom says that. Hinduism says that. Buddhism says that. Even Christianity, if uh, you really read the text in between the lines, says that as well. So, let's go back to the dream. Danielle here describes a dream that, and she says in her email to me, 
that she really thinks that this dream is the from the collective uh, unconscious because um, there's a lot of elements that there's no way that her subconscious uh, could you know could could bring up. I could not have come up with this dream consciously or by myself. Well, I just want to say something, um, a little bit of a clarification here, Danielle. Um, a dream that comes from the collective, con- the collective um, subconscious, and I'm deliberately changing the words that you've written. You wrote unconscious, and I'm saying subconscious for the distinction that I've said in the beginning. The collective subconscious is is essentially the collective consciousness of all of humanity. What your conscious mind can conjure is very different than what your subconscious can conjure. Your subconscious can come up with anything it wants from any life that you have lived. It can come up with anything it wants from anything that you have perceived through your five senses within even this lifetime that you haven't even brought up to conscious awareness. And this is a great example to show how the unconscious mind, which is a part of the conscious mind, works versus the subconscious. Let's say that you're looking at a particular scene in front of you. You're visiting France and you're at the Lul and you're, you know, like uh, looking at things and your conscious mind notices a particular painting that you like and notices a man standing behind you who feel you feel like he's standing too close. Your subconscious mind captures a lot more. It captures other people. It captures other paintings. It captures uh, something dirty on the floor that you haven't even noticed. Your conscious mind doesn't know that. Now, all these things that are being captured, we can put under the category, I'm sorry, I said the subconscious, we can put under the category of the unconscious mind. The subconscious can use that. We are unconscious we're we're not conscious of the of the fact that we have perceived these things but the subconscious can access that and therefore your dream can be from the collective from the collective subconscious or can just be from your own subconscious it doesn't really matter when does it matter when a dream is from the collective subconscious uh, versus not when we can use the collective subconscious to understand the dream. And just from my own very limited experience in dream interpretation, um, I don't think it matters at this particular point in time when it comes to your dream. And I'll give you an example where it does matter. Stan Groth, the famous um, Czech uh, psychologist, Uh, who investigated a lot of people under the influence of LSD. And then when it got uh, to be um, illegal, he developed a method called holotrophic breathwork in which he tried to help his patients to uh, access the collective subconscious and their own subconscious in order to heal the issue. He had a patient that uh, he was schizophrenic and he was just sitting and drawing really, really strange, very complex geometric shapes and very unhappy with his drawings, always the kind of like uh, tearing the piece of paper and throwing it at the end and just really fascinated and obsessed with drawing this thing again and again and again and again and again. Well, he didn't know how to help him and you know, when he uh, put him under uh, the influence of LSD, or maybe it was holotrophic breathwork, I don't know, same same thing, um, the patient described that he was uh, walking through a gate and a big monster um, that had a pig face had swords and she threatened to kill him, to kill him. Well, years have passed by, you know, the patient uh, did what he did and Stan Groff has moved to the U.S. since and uh, um, became who he became. And one of his closest friends was Joseph Campbell, who we all know. Joseph Campbell was uh, probably to date is the uh, world's greatest expert on um, collective consciousness and uh, various rituals, uh, uh, essentially cultures uh, across the world and their various rituals uh, related to spirituality and religion. And he was walking with Joseph Campbell and he told him about this particular patient 
Well, Joseph Campbell told him, hold on, hold on. I, I know what this is about. This is about a particular tribe in Africa, a, very, a lost tribe or in South America, I can't remember. And in that particular tribe, they believed in a god that had a pig face and their right of passage was, you know, the, the when you got to became of age, you had to be able to draw a particular shape, a particular geometric shape, in perfect, in perfect, in a particular perfect way, and only if you did that, uh, then she wouldn't kill you when you passed through the through the opening. Now, this particular individual has tapped into the collective the collective subconscious the subconscious of this, <clears throat> the entire uh, uh, subconscious of the people of Earth, and brought something from there. And to Stan Groff, that was a clue. And had he known that at the time, he could have helped that particular patient in understanding why he was so obsessed with drawing these shapes. It was something that had to do with the rite of passage, something that had to do with his, with his coming of age. Now, when we talk about a dream, such as yours, Danielle. We are talking about particular elements that are repeating in many different dreams. Cars, water, highway, darkness, light. These are generic elements. And I did not see any archetypal scenarios necessarily that are related to the collective um, subconscious. But again, it does not matter. What matters is that this particular dream has spoken to you. And then now, before we dive dive in and analyze it a little bit, because it's a fascinating dream, and I really want to give an example to our listeners and how one can analyze the dream, I want to talk a little bit about our own interpretation. And that is direct, directed uh, to everybody, but especially to you, Danielle. Because whatever I'm about to say is not relevant to you necessarily. Because only we are the only ones who can really interpret our own dreams. Everybody has a different pool of subjective reality and therefore a different pool of subjective symbols that we build as we analyze our own dream. So for example, for one person, a car in a dream can mean the body, the vessel in which our soul resides. In other, for other people, a car can mean a home. It could mean um, a way, a particular method, a tool to get from one place to another. That is a means with which to achieve one's goals. For another, a car can mean, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, some kind of uh, uh, a temporary place of dwelling. So you have to ask yourself. And I'm saying that to everybody. One has to ask one to ask oneself, what does a car represent to me in a dream? And as uh, in more and more dreams you have a particular vehicle, then you can ask yourself, why? And once you decide that a, a vehicle represents something to you, then you can ask yourself, why was it that this type of vehicle appeared in the dream and not another? Because once you make a decision, remember your subconscious knows that you have made that decision, right? So for Danielle, for example, she writes that vehicle maybe equals ego slash body slash mind. She's asking. And uh, I would say, um, ask yourself what resonates with you. I can tell you for me, when I dream, a vehicle for me represents the body always. And the question I would ask you is why was it a big truck? Why wasn't it uh, a super fast car? A truck usually is a very aggressive vehicle, a vehicle that is, you know, that is, you're protected in a, in a truck. I once had a car accident where I got hit by a bus. I was literally got hit by a bus. How cliche, right? Because nothing, there's no accidents. We said so. Um, and I was in a truck. It saved my life. So why was it a big truck? And for everybody, it could be a different answer. For some, say, oh, a big truck, it means that I go through, I plow through life, right? Well, for you, Danielle, you have to ask yourself, what is your connection to, to trucks? Because your subconscious knows about your relationship to trucks. So for you, maybe a truck means 
Uh, maybe you're a liberal and thinks that trucks are stupid and, uh, you know, wastes, uh, waste gas. And, uh, you know, why do people have, have, have trucks? Maybe you, you live in a farm and you own a truck and you love trucks. Maybe you're a four-wheeler. Everybody has a different association when it comes to a truck. Maybe when you were young, you were taught how to drive a truck and you felt that it was way too big for you and you couldn't, you couldn't control it. So you have to ask yourself, that's why it's almost impossible for somebody to interpret the dream for you. If you were here with me, I would ask you all these questions. I would say, what does a truck mean to you? Do you drive a truck? Do you feel comfortable driving a truck? You can't see anything. You're terrified. No shit. Wow. Driving like that in the, um, in the dark, the ultimate letting go of control. You can't, you don't even have a steering wheel. You don't have a gas pedal. You don't have any brakes. Dreams of losing control, having no control are very common. And they usually suggest that uh, we have something in our life that we're trying too much to take control in our lives. And I would say that this dream, just shooting from the hip, is a huge, huge, clear message saying, you don't have control. And you have to learn to let go of control. And when you do let go of control, it is only then when you actually know what to do. And let me tell you, this is a metaphor for life in general. And I would say to each and every one of us, regardless of your dream, regardless of your pool of symbols, this is true for you. You think you're in control. You are not. Life happens. And the second you think you're in control, life will happen to you and show you that it's not because that's the one biggest mistake that we can make as spiritual seekers, as just citizens of humanity. Living in this density, in this illusion, you are not in control. You're only processing what's happening to you. You don't want to be in control. You don't know enough to be in control. The entire purpose of the spiritual quest, of the spiritual journey, is to learn to let go of control. You have to let your higher self lead the show, and you do that through her, through your subconscious. You have to stop relying on the conscious mind, on your logic, and you have to start trusting intuition. You have to let the feminine lead. That is what life is about. And the second we do that, then we know what to do. Then the conscious mind knows what to do. Oh, turn on the lights. And that is symbolic, obviously, to suddenly there was light. Suddenly you will know what to do because she knows what to do. Without her, you're in darkness. With trying to think your way through life, you're not going to be able to make it. You have to learn to listen to her. You have to learn to use your intuition. And you have to relax. I think the biggest metaphor for life, there's so many. I mean, really, you can find that in anything, in woodworking, in painting, in writing, uh, in, uh, I mean, anything, in ping pong. And you can take each and every one of these methodologies, sports, uh, habits, uh, hobbies, and you can make that a metaphor for life. But the one I love is riding a bike with no hands. Riding, by, uh, uh, riding a bike with no hands is a great metaphor for life. The only way to actually make that happen is to relax. You have to let go. You have to trust that the body will know what to do, and you have to keep pedaling. You have to show up. You still have to do action. If you're going to stop pedaling, you will fall. So you have to stop to, to, to keep pedaling, and you have to stop looking at the road. Instead, you have to look ahead to where you want to go. The body will do the rest. It even knows how to turn. That is a great metaphor for life. Look ahead where you want to go, what do you want to achieve, and let her guide you there. You still have to act. You still have to pedal. You still have to show up. Oh, I want to teach uh, uh, a course on the Hebrew letters in the university. I'm going to set the goal. 
I'm going to put it out there. I'm going to let her lead me. I'm going to talk to the people I meet about that and do what I need to do. But I'm not going to try too hard. I'm not going to start sending emails to all the people and like, just like, oh, why can't I make it? And maybe this university, maybe that university. No, I'll follow my intuition. My intuition tells me to speak to this and that person and to kind of continue from there and just let go. And it'll happen. If it's supposed to be, it'll happen. So when we talk about your dream, Danielle, when we talk about this kind of a dream, it is, it is, um, it's quintessential. You let go of the panic. You no longer panic when you realize that there was a conscious and aware being above you, is what you said. It was some, somewhat comforting and panic subsides. Faith can help us get there, can help us relax. And then we can actually listen to her because we're not, fo- we're not following our, the desire of the conscious mind, the false desire. We're following instead the desire of the subconscious mind, which is really, it's not really her desire, it's the desire of the higher self. She just communicates that to us. And suddenly the night is gone and everything is going to get illuminated and it's going to be full noonday sun. And then you finally saw that, you actually saw that you were an overpass, the high road, you're right, and I agree. And there's many roads below you, which means you've passed a lot, you've done a lot, you've got somewhere. And the overpass makes a sudden, very sharp turn, and that can mean a lot of different things. And you travel back to where you were. And you say, that can mean the return home. And I will say, yes, uh, there's a law in, uh, there is, in Hebrew wisdom, there is uh, seven pieces to the conscious, to to our consciousness, seven laws of the universe, and seven stages of enlightenment. Together, 21 plus one more potentiator, that's the 22 letters. One of the laws of, 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 the, of the universe and consciousness is the, laws of, the law of cycles. Everything repeats itself. So don't think just because you're on the high road that it ended, that you've arrived, that this is it, that from now on you're only going to be in the water of bliss. It always goes back. We start all over on a higher road. But we start all over. You go back to where you came from. Everything dies and renews. Everything vibrates and everything renews again and again and again and again. And each time we learn a different lesson. So maybe the dream means that you've learned the lesson that you're supposed to learn. And now you start over. We're learning a different lesson. And when we do that, when we let go, we truly can find the joy within. You know, this reminds me of a quote that I read from Quo. Quo is a, an entity that's being channeled by LL Research, Light Love Research. Um, and uh, in 1994, June 19, 1994, they have channeled the following. Here is how to be joyful. Upon the arising, turn to the infinite one and instant by instant, Turn again to the infinite one, again and again. In all things giving thanks, in all conditions rejoicing. Turn again to the infinite one and rest in that peace which truly the world does not know. Joy is a living energy as powerful and as effective as teacher as sorrow. However, it demands that the seeker a self-imposed discipline of the personality which looks beyond ease and comfort and energize and exhorts the self again and again unceasingly to rejoice, giving praise and offer thanksgiving to the infinite one. And in other words, this is me now, what this quote is telling us, that the answer is simple. It's a lot more simple than we think. How do we live in joy? We live in joy by finding joy in every moment beyond the hardship. It's there. And we do that by finding the Creator in everything we do. The Creator is not a separate entity sitting up in the sky. It is not separate from us. It is within us. 
And in every moment right now, it is in you. And if you just stop, if you just let go of the panic, if you let go of your hands and let your body do the work, if you show up, if you pedal, and just relax and have faith, you will be able to tap into it. And suddenly, there'll be light. You'll find joy in that moment, regardless of circumstances. All the people who have reached spiritual awakening tell us that again and again and again. That when you are awakened, it is a place of presence in which you can find joy in every situation, regardless if you're hot or cold, if you're in pain, or if you're in bliss. There's always this inner peace, this inner joy. You're always swimming in a blissful water. Danielle, I want to thank you for sharing your dream with me. And I want to I want to end this episode with talking a little bit about lucid dreaming. Not a lot, uh, but a little. I'm actually thinking maybe it's it's a good topic for a future episode. Maybe find somebody to interview. But let's talk about lucid dreaming for a little bit. And I'm going to say that because you've sent me another email describing a great lucid dream that you had in which in which you've met your dog uh, that died um, a little bit before that. And... Uh, what a, what a beautiful dream. And you had the chance to reunite with her uh, one more time in that dream, and you actually realize that you're dreaming. Lucid dream is the, the state in which we realize that we're dreaming. And because we realize that we're dreaming, there's things that we can do in that particular state. Now remember, you live right now in an illusion, and when you're dreaming, that's also an illusion. It's just a state of consciousness. The difference is that when you're dreaming, that is not in this particular illusion, but rather when you're sleeping and then dreaming, that is a state of consciousness that is not subject to the laws of the universe. You can fly. You can do whatever you want. You can meet whoever you want. Or at least create in that reality whatever you want. And you can communicate with your higher self. Lucid dreaming is very powerful. Now, the way to to lucid dream is to train yourself, to ask yourself, is this a dream? And there's all kinds of things that happen in lucid dreaming that will tell you that you're dreaming. For example, um, let's say you're going into the shower and you are um, looking at the shampoo bottle and I'm, I can't remember the name of the book. It's a book about lucid dreaming. And um, I'll pull it out and put it in the show notes. But um, it's an example from that book. So you look at the shampoo bottle and you look at the list of, you know, um, ingredients. Or just look at the label. And then you look away and then look again at the shampoo bottle. If the label has changed, that's a good example. That's a good indicator that you are dreaming. Try to turn on the light or turn it off. If it doesn't turn off or it doesn't turn on, that's a great indication you're dreaming. Now do that 20 times a day. Do it in every, uh, turn, on, turn, turn your watch upside down, like uh, the, 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 the watch on the bottom portion of the arm versus on the top. And every time you're looking at your watch and it's like, oh, why is it down? Oh yeah, is this a dream? Am I dreaming? This way you'll train yourself to ask yourself, am I dreaming? And what's going to happen if you do it enough times? At some point in your dream, you will ask yourself, am I dreaming? And you're going to do something. You're going to jump and see if you're landing back on your feet or maybe you're hovering and flying. And at some point, you'll be doing that and you'll realize you're dreaming. Now, the second you've realized that you're dreaming, the second step is to know what to do at that point. Because that happened to me a lot. I actually realized that I was dreaming, but then I didn't know what to do with it. I was like, oh, oh, wow, I, 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 I can fly. I'm dreaming right now. Ooh, what do I want to do? And then usually I aim for the sky. Oh, I want to meet my higher self. Uh, help me meet my teacher. But maybe it's not time. So it's tricky. 
um, you sort of have to fall into a reality when you where you let her lead because if you try to lead too much with your conscious mind that has now tapped into the dream, then it's not going to work out. So you kind of it's almost like a uh, how should I say when you're driving a um, sort of like when you're flying a plane. I don't know for those of you who have done this. You're doing very, very gentle movements with the, uh, with the, uh, with the, uh, with you know, with this, with, with the. I can't remember what, what, what it's called. If you want to turn, because if you're gonna, it's like driving a car really, really fast. If you're gonna uh, turn the wheel really fast, you, you're just gonna, you know, you're just gonna go way off, right? It's very, very subtle movements, and you just let them flow. Same thing in the lucid dream. Just kind of take it in a particular direction and see. See where it goes. Very, very gentle. Oh, maybe I want to fly. Or maybe I want to, to go explore and let her take you and explore. But realize that you're dreaming. And if you do meet someone, maybe you ask them questions. Maybe you just enjoy yourself. Don't get attached. The second you're going to get attached, you're going to wake up don't get attached. So that's lucid dreaming. And there's a lot of books about how to, how to lucid dream. And it's not for everybody. Um, but it's a, a, an extremely powerful tool for transformation and for just enjoying yourself and uh, becoming more familiar with the sensations of the communication with the subconscious and how to, how to become aware of the intuitive guidance that she is giving us. So that's it for today. We spoke about dreaming a little bit more. We gave uh, Danielle's dream as an example for a dream and how to analyze it. We showed how individualized dreams are and how important it is to stick to our own questions, to ask ourselves why. Another question that's important to ask, and I did not mention, how did I feel? Danielle was very, very good at describing her um sensations and feelings throughout the dream it's very important. a lot of people uh, i keep a dream diary a lot of people do that a lot of people track their dreams but they write what happened what they saw versus their emotions it's very important to ask what did i feel because the feelings will suggest what the dream is supposed to tell us the vast majority of our dreams are here to tell us about a particular distortion that we have in our psyche towards reality and how to fix it what do we need to work on next? And so remembering and writing down how we felt is very, very important. Again, listen to episode seven in order to get various tips about, about dreaming. We spoke about that. We spoke about how the subconscious works, about the different parts of consciousness, how she communicates with us. And we spoke about lucid dreaming. The book, by the way, about lucid dreaming is called Exploring the World of Lucid Dreaming by Stephen LeBerg, PhD, and Howard Rangel, the step-by-step -step guide to lucid dreaming. This is it for today. I thank you all for listening. I thank you, Danielle, for sending uh, your sweet note. I welcome you all to write me. I want to hear from you. From Spokane, Washington. This is Ovadia Batat, your host, wishing her love in every moment.